Hello, my name is Aran and welcome to part 8 of my old 20 Master series. This one is about tokens. This one is for everyone, though there will be some guide or, and or advanced stuff towards the end. First off, let's look at tokens from the player's point of view. If you have a token you can access on the map, it's because the guide of the game gave you one specifically or attached one to a character sheet that you own. When you click on the token, you will see five things. The first three are the bars that are associated with your token, green bar, blue bar, and red bar. Those can be changed by the game master. And you will also see access to your token settings and your token markers. With your token, you can double click to open the token settings, and you can shift double click to open the character sheet. If you open your token settings as a player, this is all you will have access to, the name, the values of each of the three bars, and your two auras. An aura generates, well, an aura around the token at the distance that you specified to show you the size of the affected area. This is great for uh, signifying area of effects, for spells that you cast from yourself, or any kind of area of effect emanating from your token. Just set it here and save changes to activate it, and delete and save changes to deactivate it. In D&D, I use the first bar for health, the second one for AC, and the third one for the character's class resource. If you are a player and you've set your display name at the bottom to indicate the important things, like your AC, then you can use the second bar for another class resource if you want. Also, when you click on the token and it has a character sheet attached, you will see the attached token actions as they appear on the character sheet. And if you click on the marker icon, you will have access to all the markers attached to this game. The first color markers and the X are always available, but the rest is determined by your GM when you play. For example, I have the default marker set and an extended marker set I use for D&D, with a lot of specific markers. Remember that you can click on a marker to add it, click it again to remove it, and if you hover over a marker you want and click a number, it will appear with that number. The only exception is the X that marks the entire character as supposedly dead, and that one cannot be marked with a number. You can also hover over a marker with a number and change it however you want. When you have your token selected, you can move it around. The easiest way is using the arrow keys, but you can also pick it up and drop it anywhere you want, following the restricted movement set by your guide. But there's another trick. When you pick it up, you can right-click and then see the distance you're traveling and even set waypoints with each additional right-click. If for some reason your mouse does not support a right click, you can pick up your token and then use the Q button to do the same thing. When you do this, you won't see it for yourself, but the other players will see the token move through the waypoints that you signified. Also, when you select your token, you can see this kind of handle over here. You use this to rotate the token however you want. However, it will lock to 45 degree angles unless you hold Alt while you drag, in this case you can put it wherever you want. Another way to do this is by using E and scrolling the mouse to rotate. This will rotate by 45 degree angles. The easiest way to think about this is looking at the left side of the token, over here, and when you click E, think about rolling that side up and down. Another useful trick is when you click a token that you have access to, you can click X to see its last movement. That's pretty much all there is from the player point of view. Let's switch over to guides. When you open the token settings as a guide, you will see something slightly different. This will remind you the default game settings you saw while creating the game. This is for the token settings. Here you can select which character sheet this token represents. It doesn't have to represent anything, but when it does represent a character sheet, you can attach various resources to the bars and use token actions. When you select a character sheet, it will switch over the name to that of the character sheet. But you can also override it yourself with whatever you want. If the token is attached to a character sheet, it will only be controlled by whoever is allowed to control the character sheet. If it is not attached to a character sheet, you can select here which players are allowed to control it. The tint color allows you to, well, tint the token with whatever color you want. For example, if someone casts Fairy Fire on that character, you can set it to be pink. And if you don't want it to be tinted, remember to select this is the transparent. On the right side, you can see the values of the bars. This is what players can see also, but you can also attach resources from the character sheet 
to this token. For example, the blue bar on this character sheet will always be what the NPC AC stat is on the character sheet. And if this is a unique character, you can set the first bar to inherit the HP value. And then when you change it here, you will also change it on the character sheet. Do not do this if you're running multiple copies of the same character sheet. For example, a bunch of bandits. In the advanced tab, you will also see things you might remember from creating a new game from the default settings. And these are these permissions and light values. Here you can set if the owner of this token can edit any of these values whether any player can see any of these values, but only the bar itself. This text overlay is still only visible to the editors. You can set it to visible to everyone or just plain hidden. You can also set individually where you want the bars to be located. In this section, you can set the light values for the token. The light radius indicates how far the character will emit light. The left value is the far number and the Middle value is the start of dim light. You can also set the angle of the light emitted, but that's usually just annoying. If you set this checkbox, then the light emitted from the token will not only be visible to the player who owns the token, but to everyone. For example, this is the difference between someone who has dark vision and can see farther in the dark, and someone who has a torch. If you set this value, then the token will have its individual sight. The owner of the token will be able to see from the position of that token. You always have to set this for PC characters, and it's preferable you do not set this for NPC characters, because light calculation is performance heavy. In here, there is a different value for how far you want Advanced Fog of War to be revealed from this token. For example, I can set this bandit to have 40 feet of light radius with 20 feet of dim, has sight, Advanced Fog of War reveal 40 feet. This is like this bandit is carrying a torch. As you can see, it is now revealing the area around it in this darkness. And as the guide, you can always select a token and click Ctrl L to see what that token is seeing just by itself. And if you use Advanced Fog of War, you can also see what fog has been revealed for this token. I will not go into the updated dynamic lighting because I think this feature is far from perfect and currently there is no big performance boost from using it over the regular advanced fog of war, so I'm not going to touch it until it's a perfect feature. While every player can click a token that they own and click Z to see the image of the token full screen, which is another reason why you want to use high quality token images, if you are the guide you can click any token and click Shift Z and then that token will be shown to everyone, like this. Now, as the guide, you also have access to the right-click options menu on each token. The top option will add that token to the turn order. You can also do this with a shortcut, as I've explained in the map interface video. Under the edit section, you have all the actions that you might expect. One note is that when you copy a character, yes, the shortcuts work, and paste it, then the copy of the character in memory is the one that you had when you copied it. If you change something about the original token, it will not be copied over to the next one. If, for example, you have multiple tokens on top of each other, you can click each one and send it to the back or send it to the front. So you can grab things that are behind other things. When you drag tokens around, they conform to grid as if they are characters. But if you go to Advanced and set is drawing, then they will not be considered characters anymore. As you can see, they have no bars. They will be considered dressing in the scene, and you can put them wherever you want. However, if you turn is drawing off, you can still do this if you hold Alt while dragging the token around. You can also flip the token horizontally, flip it vertically, or set its dimension specifically in pixels or in grid units. The layer option allows you to send a token to a specific layer, for some reason not the dynamic lighting layer, but you can also do this with the shortcuts as I've shown you in the creating a new maps video. If you created a table of tokens like I've shown you in the collection video, you can go to that table, click token, and that token will appear inside the game, giving you a multi-sided token you can choose sides of or randomly select. What VTTS adds to the right-click options menu is Firstly, the ability to roll bulk macros. If the selected tokens, you select a group, has macros that are shared with everyone, then you can select roll bulk macros, click the macro you want, and it will roll it for each of them. 
A kind of specific bulk macro that VTTS allows is the hit dice, which rolls the character's hit dice and sets the value in the bar of your choosing. This is how I usually show my PCs other NPCs. I don't let them see a bar. I let them guess who's going to fight and who's not. Only when the fight starts, I select everything I want, click hit dice, and each gets rolled and assigned HP values. If for some reason you have a marker and you don't know where its image is, you can right click it and select copy token image URL, and then just view it in your browser or download it. You can also resize custom, which is an advanced version of the set dimensions options. You can set what size of the square is and how many squares you want the token to be. You can even position it at the top left corner and then it'll happen. Easier way to set character size. The resize fit option fits the token to the width or the height of the map, whichever is shorter, and it's mostly used for maps. See the creating a new maps video. Now for an advanced guide tip, if you have players who use a lot of area of effect spells, you can set that area of effect to be a token character. All you have to do is create a character sheet, it doesn't really matter what the character sheet is, add the image you want for the area of effect, make sure it's the image for the token, set the size of the area of effect you want, for example a fireball is a 20 foot radius, make sure you update the default and all tokens if available, and the next time you drag that fireball in, you'll have the size of a fireball, all ready to set wherever you want it to be. Another advanced tip is if your map contains lights imbued in the map, like a campfire or a torch that the map already includes but doesn't emit actual light in your game scene, you can create a marker, a simple empty marker that you can easily pick up, open the token settings, set it to emit the light that you want, make sure all players see light, and then move it to the lighting layer, and then it emits light. And players can see it, but they don't see the marker itself. When you want to turn it off, move it to the GM layer. And that's it for tokens, thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.